right? Good morning, dear Ty. Good morning, dear sisters. I thank you, Dylan, for the introduction. I realize I am very happy, and it's easy for me to recognize at the moment that uh, I feel a great deal of confidence in the practice and in the community. And uh, it's, it's such a feeling of delight and ease, uh, which is um, just delicious. It's not a combination of feelings that I'm quite used to yet <laughs> at my age. Uh, the topic that I'd like to mention is the, uh, the process of addressing deep seated seeds of suffering which I've spent my life avoiding, but uh, with the help of Sangha members, uh, specifically um, our friend Glenn Schneider and Denise, my wife, uh, I've learned technique to, uh, to face these and to uh, understand them and uh, be thankful for them. Uh, this began uh, at a point several years ago where Glenn uh, said, oh my goodness, there's this book called Transformation at the Base. And I uh, tried to read it and uh, chapter after chapter, and it was so dense, I, I gave up. But he uh, brought my attention to a specific section that, uh, was a revelation. Um, I'll mention that this book uh, has been republished uh, under a separate title called Understanding Our Mind. And I was fascinated to read the tiny little note on the uh, page of the uh, um, editor's uh, claim there, you know, the first page after the title page, uh, all the information about who designed it and his bin number and so on. This, this book is a compilation of talks given by Ty on two continents at five different retreats over a period of nine years, between 89 and 98. So this is a topic that he was chewing on. And it was the editors at Parallax at the time who did the job of pulling it together uh, in their inimitable way to uh, make it cl clear and simple. So uh, the specific chapter that Glenn brought to my attention is chapter 45 entitled Mindfulness, and uh, begins, it's, the chapter is only five pages long. It's a gold mine. It begins with a uh, description of Buddha's suggestion that we recite and consider the uh, five remembrances every day, which are, I'm of the nature to grow old, have ill health, to die, everything one near to me, dear to me, and everything I cherish are bound to uh, change, and my actions are my only true belongings. So it's a practice of, of looking at the hard stuff, and uh, it is something which uh, every time I do it, it actually makes me very happy because, uh, for example, about old age, uh, I'm reminded that I'm not dead yet. So I still have another chance at all this. So uh, I says this is a specific practice to bring up uh, suffering and be able to look at it as opposed to being sidelined uh, by it or uh, avoided. Uh, it 
I'm going to quote, the practice of the five remembrances helps us to face our fears directly and not see them as enemies. So uh, he goes on to say, our afflictions must be accepted before they can be transformed. The more we repress them, the more significant they become. What can we do to transform our deep seated, deep rooted seeds of suffering? There are three ways to work with them. In one and a half pages, he describes the process. The first is to focus on sowing and watering our seeds of happiness. When you go to Deer Park, we're not sitting seven hours a minimum a day. Uh, we're singing, chanting, uh, enjoying cooking and eating, walking. Uh, we are nourishing ourselves to make ourselves, to help ourselves feel at home in the world and in each other's company. It becomes a safe place and we feel safe. The second way to practice mindfulness is the second way to deal with the deep rooted seeds of suffering is to practice mindfulness continuously so that when the seeds of suffering arise, we will be able to recognize them. And the third way is to deliberately bring them up into our mind consciousness. This is a more difficult uh, process. And I'll quote, try is so clear on this. And so to say, someone who is suffering greatly and does not know how to practice mindfulness should not start out practicing the third way, inviting the seeds of suffering up into our conscious mind. Dealing with suffering is like handling a poisonous snake. We have to learn about the snake and we ourselves have to grow stronger and more able and stable too, in order to handle it without being harmed ourselves. We should only invite our suffering up when we are ready. Then when it comes, we can safely handle it. So this explains why I and many of us avoid our suffering because we don't have the uh, chops, I guess we could call it, the ability, the confidence to deal with it. I had a, an affliction I'll, I'll say it differently. I had a reaction to someone for 15 years, 20 years, that did not change. I was annoyed, felt uncomfortable, did not want to be around this person, and had a very strong depiction that this was their problem, the way they spoke to me or didn't. Um, the way they were at a distance, had a, a uh, were defended, I should say, uh, but pretended to be very outgoing and charming. But it just rattled me, and I avoided this person. And for years, I would complain to Denise, and for years, Denise politely listened and said, Caleb, you should really look at that. Well, I mean, I had no idea that it had anything to do with me. But Glenn offered his uh, technique of how to deal with this sort of problem. It involves what Pema Chodron calls dropping the story and going to the body. Or what Lin Chi, the yeah, ninth century uh, Chinese Zen ancestor of ours called Drop the object. There's, there's no way to really understand what that is, but Glenn spelled it out for me. And I applied it to this particular person, very clearly this person who was the problem. 
I um, set aside a morning, like today, late winter, cold, very clear. And I sat until I was comfortable, settled, solid, open. And I deliberately called for the image of this person's face and open myself to the stories that arise in my mind and what would arise. And what happened is that I got hot and bothered and agitated and this was perfect. I brought these feelings up and then I let them go. This is a practice which is possible as a meditator, I think you would agree. When you think you've got something, you say, okay, well, perhaps, but I'm gonna go back to my breath. It's a way to stand off from one part of our thinking and set it aside and not believe everything we think. So I got fired up with this story about this person. And then I let it go, set it aside, and scanned my body, top to bottom, bottom to top. I couldn't detect anything that was, you know, a big knot in my heart, ringing in my ear, you know, no physical manifestation could I detect. So I went back to the story, did it again, got myself all worked up thinking of this person and how, how upset it was to be around them. And uh, scan my body and it felt a little bit cool there. And I, I put my blanket a little bit closer around me and uh, scanned, didn't see anything. The third time I did it, I, I was, I recognized it was cold. There was a uh, window seat with a big view. It was in the bright sun inside our living room. And I sat there with a wool hat on, a blanket around me in the bright sun. And I was shivering and I go, oh, oh, okay, cold. I feel cold. That's a physical manifestation. So I allowed myself to feel that completely relaxed and shivered. My teeth started to chatter, rattle. And I just let that act out, just let it roll. And I was just shivering all over and all over and saying, oh, just let it happen, okay, just all in. And a vision occurred to me. clear as a bell of a little boy, about six, back to me, facing a house, pitch dark, standing in the snow, up to his knees, looking at this house in the dark, and a light off to the side illuminated enough you could see the outline of his child. And I looked at this crystal clear image for about two seconds. And I just burst into tears, sobbing. I cried for about 10 minutes. I was rolling on the floor, moaning and sobbing. Never anything like that, never happened. And then it subsided and the words came to mind, left out in the cold. And when I said that, I started crying again. And then I recovered and felt very clear. And 
I went back to that person, the object of my dissatisfaction. And there was no charge at all. There was compassion and some curiosity. Why would that person be that? And perhaps most amazing is that my relationship with that person, that experience of feeling annoyed and bothered so deeply by, has gone away. I don't think about them in the same way. I don't react to them in the same way. It's, it's gone, it's clean. A number of years later, I underwent a very long, deep uh, therapeutic process with a uh, therapist who was a Buddhist practitioner and uh, spent the whole 14 weeks, about 25 hours a week, writing and meeting about my life up until the age of puberty. And just a couple weeks in, she said, Caleb, There are three kinds of abuse. I said, oh, okay, tell me. She said, yes, there's physical abuse. There's uh, emotional abuse, okay. And there's neglect. And it was like a, I was hit by lightning. I just was shocked. Oh my God, there's a word to describe my childhood. I didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't have the words in our family to say, lonely, sad, hurt, neglected. But I was. And I spent my life trying to learn how to connect. And thanks to the practice, and particularly Dharma sharing, where I've learned to listen to myself, how to do that. Um, so this person that I mentioned who was such a thorn in my side uh, was responding to me in ways that I felt left in the cold, neglected, and it just hit that spot in me that was so vulnerable and so untouchable. I had no idea it was there. So practice a finger to me and I owe it to Guy, the Sangha, uh, my friends, and very grateful to be here. Thank you.